Happy Friday, everyone. Hi, hello, and welcome back to another episode of VCTV. Today is a Friday. This is a weekend episode. This is the last day of the week, and I call it weekend episode of VCTV. And welcome back, uh, uh, speakers um, Vandana, Marine, Harsh, Kartik, Gary, and my co moderator, Maxine. So it's amazing. Thank you. Uh, and, and it's always you know awesome to be with you guys. It's like a family, VCTV family. And what else? So today we're gonna to talk. We're gonna discuss. We're gonna. Um, it's it's a. It's not a. It's not a topic about uh, uh, technology or any particular industry. But it's a topic about a person, a personality, who is the CEO of a startup. Okay. So let's talk about him or her. How should this person look like, or how should this person behave like? What are what are his what are his traits? So for an investor. Is investing in a startup? Is he really investing in the company, the product, or is he, or is he investing in the people? So let's just hear all the details from from our investor community today, with all their experience that they have uh, in this space, um, to know more what makes a good CEO of a startup. So yes, before I start introducing my speakers, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Sunny Mohanty. I'm the original director of Lato Token Based here in Singapore. I host VCTV, and I love doing that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a part of VCTV today. Uh, let's start with the uh, uh, women I have in my panel today. Vandana, over to you. Please, let's start with you first. Your introduction and background, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Sunny, for having me here. Uh, over and over again and uh, nice to see you all uh, Dr. Madden, Harsh, Karthik uh, and Gary um, happy to see you every almost every day Gary uh, so <laughs> that's really awesome so I'll just introduce uh, uh, myself I was in Singapore and Jakarta for 15 years in investment banking um, I had my own family office fund there this is my sixth year back in India. I did some investments, then I went back to advisory. Currently, I'm connected with 200 investors globally. I'm about to reach 250 uh, over there. And we pick up global deals. We are sector agnostic. Typically, we do $1 million to $25 million. And please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Perfect. Sure, Vandana, will do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Next, I have Marin. Hi, Maren. Welcome back from Singapore. Hi, how are you? Long time. Uh, very well. Hello to everybody. So let me quickly introduce myself. So the headline would be from traveler to islander. So I'm living in Singapore since 2013 now. I'm the CEO of uh, Schweizer's Gross Capital Arm and Family Office here in Singapore. I've spent my career in various industries, all started off in aviation, then in automotive electronics, and then I ended up uh, in investment management. I'm sitting on the advisory board of HDI Global, uh, which is an industrial insurance company in Germany, active in 150 countries. And I'm very happy to be here and share my perspectives on uh, actually uh, selecting, mentoring, and also endorsing sea uh, levels in startups. Oh, yes, that's very important. Thank you so much, Maren. Love to hear your insights. Thank you and welcome back on VCTV. Next, I'd like to go with Harsh. Hi, Harsh. Thanks for joining us back. Hey, Sony. Glad to be back and glad to see familiar faces like Vanna, Karthik, and Gary, and meeting Marin for the first time as well. So, a uh, short bio about myself I'm a venture partner with Our Ventures. I'm currently, I have founded my own startup group called Startup Packers, where I'm helping early stage startups kind of grow their business. The group is available on Facebook and provide a lot of mentoring and guiding over there. I help in startups fundraise all the way from $1 million to $10 million across the world and helping them scale their businesses. So Indian businesses looking to expand globally or global businesses looking to expand into India. I help them out with strategic connections and great to be a part of this panel again. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for that introduction and welcome back. Uh, Karthik, Karthik, welcome back on VCTV. It's a Friday in Dubai, which means it's a holiday. It's a public holiday. It's like a Sunday. So welcome back. Many thanks to be 
many thanks to you to be here today. Thank you so much uh, for the records episode number 72 with you guys. And uh, it's always been fun. Uh, I represent a couple of family offices based in the UK and a venture fund based out of Qatar and uh, my own incubator idea factory which uh, helps and supports startups in fintech and edutech and at the same time i'm mentoring three startups based out of india primarily into the e-commerce and social media space uh, actively involved in developing and incubating startups and setting up c-level advisories and recruiting uh, c-level positions for startups perfect thank you thank you Karthik, for that intro uh last we have gary hi gary good morning how are you? Good morning. You know, I feel like I'm on family hour here. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody. I've been around 72 right. times. I think I've been around almost the whole 72, Kartik. I've seen you many <laughs> shows. So it's great to see everybody here. Anyway, my name's Gary Fowler. I'm a country boy. I was originally born in uh, Pennsylvania, so I grew up on the side of a mountain, a 500 person village. Um, I'm the CEO, co founder, and president of GSD Venture to its premier AI and quantum venture studio. I've been involved in 17 companies, two unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, sold to Salesforce uh, for 1.35 billion, and also Eva.ai, which company I founded almost five years, actually five years exactly. Wow. Ago. And um, I love AI. I read a lot. I've written 124 articles now or just kept published uh, Cognitive Cloud Computing yesterday. And uh, my next article is on quantum tunneling and the impact on wireless communication. So that's it. It's great to be here. And uh, I also started the first accelerator in Russia and the number one private corporate accelerator, GVA. I was I actually co-founded both of those. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. And yes, welcome back on BCTV again, again, and again. Thank you. Uh, today, I'm joined here by Maxine uh, from uh, Latvok in Russia. Hi, Maxine. Mm, hi, Sony. Hi, everyone. So my name is Maxime, and today I will be commentating this uh, great and insightful show. I hope uh, it adds clarity on our key topic. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. OK, great. Let's talk about this person, uh, the CEO of the startup. Um, so how do we identify great CEOs? which will lead to uh, success in a long-term investment. As an investor, you're obviously, you want your money back. Nobody wants to lose money. <laughs> so you are actually betting on this person, right? When you're investing, you're actually betting on the person who's the founder or the CEO. So how do you identify a great CEO? Let's start with Vandana. Uh, well, I would look into what is the track record of the CEO. Uh, how is he building up or he or she is building up uh, their company? What is their economic strength? Uh, you know, what is the vision of the CEO? Uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, they have the characteristics of being humble, uh, you know, have the perseverance or, uh, you know, they just want to, uh, you know, what are they planning? Are they planning to uh, fail or they are planning to succeed? Uh, you know, so these are some of the factors I look into as a uh, when I look for investments uh, and I look into the CEO's characteristics and what is the educational background as well. I do look into that as well. So right. I think these are some of the important characteristics. Education. Yes, for sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Vandana. Marine, for you, how important it is uh, to hire when you're looking to hire the CEO of a company that you funded that you that you've invested in and what kind of so what steps do you follow to make sure you are hiring the right person for the company yeah well we are looking and assessing uh, actually behavior in respect to leadership skills so we are looking for four behaviors through assessment and a lot of personal talks one is how supportive the person can be Secondly is how well the person can operate with strong result orientation. So walk and deliver your talk. Uh, nextly, uh, how well the person can seek different perspectives. Also the corporate uh, venture capital perspective as well as inside out perspectives. And fourth, how effectively the person can solve problems. So it's these four leadership traits we are looking into it 
before hiring somebody. Secondly, uh, we are looking uh, a lot into match, match with the team, match with other C-levels and existing teams. If, uh, if the company does already exist and is up and running. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Marin, for that. Um, Hush, over to you, please. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of have a slightly different take to that. I believe that the skills and characteristics of a CEO are different at different stages of a company, right? So when you're taking the company from zero to one, a different kind of skill set is required, a different set of personality is required. Likewise, if it's from one to 10, a different personality is required, a different skill set is required. Same for 10 to 100 and 100 and beyond. So we can't kind of generalize the kind of skill set and the personality that a person is required from the early stages to the later stages, right? And each and every stage requires a very specific trend, uh, type of trends, uh, specific personalities, specific traits, etc., and specific skill sets. So we need a CEO, either either a person who can kind of adapt to the skill set required at each stage, or he should be actually kind of willing that once he realizes that you know that stage has crossed, he should be willing to relinquish altogether, right? So one of my friends is actually been a successful former founder. He's, he's you know worked in one startup and now founded a second startup. He's pretty clear that you know once a startup reaches a stage of hundred, he kind of exits the operational sides of it. He still has the shareholding, but he exits the operation side of it and moves on to his next startup. And VCs actually love him for that because they understand that you know once he exits out of that, VCs can then kind of you know drive the direction of the company the, the, the way they see fit. So it works works well for both ways, where the promoter can you know work completely the way he wants to, the VCs can run the business the way they want to, and it's a win-win situation for everyone. So that is why we need to have a clear transition of skills that are required and clear understanding of skills and the mindset required at each stage. Right, 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 right. Thank you so much, uh, Kartik. Over to you, please. What do you? What are your parameters for selecting that person? So every time I set a CEO or recruit a CEO for a startup, I'm actually sending a man on a maiden voyage. It's like a captain of a ship, and he doesn't necessarily know where he is going. He just knows that he's been asked to go. So he necessarily needs to come in with a lot of risk-taking abilities. He needs to come in with a very strong vision, collaborative wisdom of trying to manage a stakeholder's uh, side of the business as well as to manage uh, the investors and to manage the co-founders because all of them are going to come in with a lot of egos. More importantly, nimble-footedness and agility is going, to be a, is, is going to be a key driver. Education is something that these days, talent is available time a dozen. It's aptitude that matters more often. And aptitude of a startup CEO is, is critical. I necessarily do not look for rigid and... Uh, SOP driven CEOs in early stage of a business, but somebody who comes in with an ability to solve problems, manage ambiguity, manage expectations, and more importantly, meander the entire entire team. More often than not, when I see CEOs who come in with a baggage of eight to 10 years of organizational leadership are very, very risk averse. They, 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 they don't even allow, or they do not build a buffer for the organization to make a mistake. While more often than not, startups are built on the premise of making mistakes and taking multiple U-turns in the first one year of the growth. So I think uh, somebody who manages his resources, manages expectations, manages people, and more importantly, is a doer. A CEO in a startup is not a glass office position any longer. CEO in a startup is a guy on the front leading the show and doing it for others. So that's 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 the kind of a CEO I would look at. As I get into a C fund, uh, series C or series E funding, then I would try and bring in a corporate uh, honcho who necessarily comes in with 20 years experience managing a lot of organizations but otherwise i would need a very strong agile smart guy that's that's my definition of a ceo perfect thank you Kartik. gary yeah sure well you know when the original mba was developed at harvard university the intention of that was to teach managers how to manage not how to be an entrepreneur so actually risk was is diametrically opposed to something that was uh, taught at Harvard University for the first MBA. So flexibility, um, the ability to accept change, the ability to do customer development, to go out and reach out to see if people really want to bribe the product or service. Uh, humble, uh, Harsh was right on target with the fact that there are different types of personalities at different levels within a company that can concede can succeed. So you look at it and for series A, series B, C, at some point you need to be operational. I say my particular interest is once you start to have meetings for meetings, 
then it's not so interesting anymore. So, you know, one of the things that we need to do is we need, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, 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 of course. Of course you, you, yeah. I, I see you going like this coming in. I'm like, wow, it must be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I've done 17 companies. I know I'm really good at taking a company up to a Series B, and that's what I like, honestly. That's what I like, and that's what GSD does. We're really good and creative about it. The same thing with my partner, Derek. That's what we do. We understand we don't like, you know, um, we're not necessarily interested in going past the Series B. Can we do it? Absolutely. So one of the things that we do is you look for people that can complement your skill sets. Remember, it's really important. You know, you look for people that have skill sets up of yourself. So when I did Eva, I'll, I use my own personal experience. David Yang is one of the, he's a genius in artificial intelligence, a billionaire. So, you know, I look for people that really can complement the skill sets of the CEO. You know, Bill Gates once said that, you know, he said, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I would hire people that are smarter than me. You got to understand that's the best person. Find people that can really uh, complement your skill sets that can help you build the company. Is it easy? No. I look for flexibility. I look for passion, optimism, visualization, because listen, building a startup isn't easy. There's ups and downs and ins and outs. You need people that can hang in with you through the downs and relish in the ups. You know, I went to dinner with the, with the Rupert Murdoch's right-hand man, Andrew Straginski, and I was humbled. I uh, went out also with Carl Page, who invited me, who's a brother of the founder of Google. And this was just three years ago. And Andrew Straginski bought the Wall Street Journal for $4 billion. And we had a couple of drinks. And I don't drink much, but I really had too many drinks. And I, he said, I've studied, Straginski said, I've studied 3,000 of the top entrepreneurs in the world. And I said, and I was fascinated. I said, what's one characteristic that you found in all the early stage entrepreneurs that's helped them succeed? And he said, um, amnesia. And I said, amnesia, he said, they don't talk about the past. They don't let it hold them down, right? You need to look today in the future, not the past. It's like a boat anchor. So those are the kind of things that you look at. And also the ability to speak, the ability to convey the message. Somebody that is, somebody said humble, of course, being humble, that's life, right? I mean, you don't have all the answers. You got to find people, you know, and have fun, be happy. The glass is half full, not half empty. You don't want to be around some negative person all the time. Oh, I don't know. Maybe this will work. Maybe it won't work. The thing is, if you don't believe in yourself and the dream, you shouldn't be doing it. So convey that message. And guess what? People come around. Sure, Gary. Thank you so much. I I can't see you, though. Oh, you can't see me? Oh. No. Your video was switched off. Well, that's what we were looking at. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was wondering why you were looking at me like you kept going like this, and I think, well, well, maybe. I, it's like this. Yeah, exactly. I didn't interrupt you because I thought probably I'm you were off video. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny, Sonny, because everybody was doing this, and I'm trying to. I think. almost jumped into the. <laughs> They're coming in closer and closer. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I thought you deliberately put yourself out. <laughs> no. <there. laughs> no, what happened is I have my basset hound here with me, and she was uh, moving around a bit. She was looking at me, so I had to uh, move her out. So I had turned it off. For <laughs> okay, it's okay. It happens. Uh, we sometimes go on mute and off video. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Uh, um, okay, thank you so much. Uh, first round. Second uh, question. I have another interesting question before <clears throat> Maxim takes over. Uh, do you think the CEO of any startup, um, as an investor, when you're investing into, or a founder, should be should be uh, from from an MBA background? Is that important? Along with several years of uh, experience in from another startup exits and stuff? Or are you looking for somebody who is from the enterprise as well that brings in that uh, sort of experience um, uh, plus some entrepreneurial experience plus an MBA degree? I emphasizing on MBAs because I think we have been taught like, you know, good entrepreneurs should have this business knowledge and that comes from the MBA studies. 
so this is very critical for me as well to understand how what exactly as are in, as investors who looking beyond those um, leadership and all those traits that you just mentioned like in terms of education so let's start with vandana first vandana over to you so uh, thanks sunny so the thing is that uh, see uh, it is not really important to have an mba degree i mean uh, look at it this way what are you going to do with that degree if you don't know how to run your show the most important thing is uh, you know having those leadership qualities having a positive attitude uh, being able to run your show well and being able to grow your company uh, you know and staying grounded at all times so i think uh, this would uh, really be uh, you know these are one of the good qualities and a ceo should have um, you know if you have an mba degree it's an added advantage because you, you know uh, of course uh, uh, you know people recognize you well in that manner but uh, you know just having the degree and not being able to run the show it really doesn't match uh, like that so i uh, really don't look at uh, you know that but of course you know if the uh, say uh, the founder has a uh, a good education background and is able to run the show and is able to you know uh, uh, you know uh, have good revenues in his uh, company uh, you know is able to run the show completely well i would look into that kind of founder so it's not that uh, you know i'm always looking for people who are from harvard or people who have mbas uh, these days harvard is also uh, you know has online uh, uh you know online courses which anybody can take it and uh, you know call themselves uh, how are educated that way so i think this is my take here right thank you pandana for sharing your views uh maren what are your views uh you know pretty similar uh any academic background like mba or others and also corporate experience in uh, in various roles is certainly not a must have it's nice to have for ceo we are more looking into uh, inspirational leaders who can really motivate the team transfer the story of the startup especially if it's early stage startups i'm pretty much in line what gary said actually uh, with one exception we want to allow everything we want the ceo who allows everything internally but nothing externally mm -hmm. so complete flexi flexibility in the company try out things uh, uh, really be on the half full class side and be very flexible so we've heard some comments already from the, from the fellow participants today it's pretty much what we are looking for steering a boat uh, in uh, in a cloudy environment that's what we are looking for i would also want to mention and then depending on uh, on on the academic background and past corporate experience uh, we would rather focusing on c chief operating officers so if you're hiring a chief operating officer as an add on um uh, to a startup board then we are looking more into experience uh, in corporate methods and so forth hmm perfect thank you so much for sharing your views uh, marin kartik uh what are your views about education degrees mbas versus years of serial entrepreneurship entrepreneurial experience so a i don't think it's either or it's always and and also the name most important thing is how much time do i have if i have a couple of years with me i'll hire somebody and i'll hone the skill sets and build competencies but to eliminate doubt in my mind and to pick up somebody who's already come through the roots i would pick up somebody who comes with a very strong academic background and depending on what stage of my business is or where do i want to sit set the person in i would look at his past experience pedigree in terms of successes pedigree in terms of vision pedigree in terms of execution finesse pedigree in terms of organizational management resource optimization because i don't have an unlimited uh, pot of gold with me so if i'm going to invest into him he needs to understand what is the timeline in which he needs to start start delivering more importantly a sense of accountability sense of accountability and i mean i i i i might even wave off his education requirements if i have 5 years to study and understand him but because i need to select people from a pool of uh, individuals available i use education as a filter because that brings in certain basic requirements he's gone through the hoops in his life 
so i might necessarily look at an mba or at least a very strong academic background more importantly i would look at his look at his past experience of managing things and managing people great points great points thank you uh, kartik for your views harsh what are your views hi um, so actually being like a premier b school mba myself i would definitely say that you know uh, it definitely adds a lot of benefits in terms of having the business knowledge the business sense and the fact that karthik pointed out right you have a track record of historic academic success you have a lot of accountability a lot of processes you have all that benefits which are there which someone from a premier b school uh, candidate has but at the same time some of those can be limitation as well right because we, you tend to be we tend to be a bit um, experimental but you tend to be very risk averse as well so there are definitely pros and cons to the same as well and it's definitely not a prerequisite it's a good to have and definitely someone with a premier b school background uh, has a lot of skills with them and can add a lot of value but at the same time i would not say that it's mandatory to have it have that way because they tend to have their own limitations in terms of you know the kind of uh, they the most of the study the academic study what we do is in the form of case studies right so we are kind of you know using the past examples to and le- learn from the past case studies and bringing it to new companies however by definition startups are kind of companies which have kind of never been created before so you you, you don't have anything to model from and you have something to create from scratch so at the same time there are some qualities which are required like extreme tenaciousness extreme yeah. resilience extreme innovation yeah. and as gary pointed out you know some sort of amnesia to kind of forget the mistakes that you're making and move on you have to be willing to take the risks and move on constantly which i sometimes find mbas tend to be a little hard with that you know they tend to be a little risk averse so that is why i would say it's you know it's like a balance it's a good to have but at the same time it's definitely not mandatory mm, great points great points ash thank you so much so gary we can see you so yeah <laughs> i'm here So you know, from my standpoint, and I have uh, in our portfolio, I have Stanford MBAs that are the CEOs and co-founder companies with me today, and so it's ability to be able to be creative and think out of the box, because when you've developed a company, you're creating something new, right? It's not like you got to be able to think through it, and you got to be able to pivot and change all the time. I know when we did Eva with David Yang, I mean, I had to pivot the company three times. and it wasn't easy so we are google like search for the personal cloud first it didn't work cuz people didn't want to pay for it then i did a smart assistant google came out with smart assistants and you can't compete with something that's free and then i i took the same patents and i pivoted over to workforce management and ai and hr tech and we took off right so and you know i'm a you know from i can take my own person i'm a psychologist and my undergraduate degree is in psychology and business my graduate degree is in psychology So I can tell you from my own experience when you're going down through this it's being able to from my perspective right it's being creative the job didn't have an MBA Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have an MBA it's to be able to figure it out it's not, you know it's not easy resilience remember there was a great boxer Muhammad Ali once said it's a person that, it's not the person that gets knocked down it's a person that gets back up again that's really important when you're doing a startup because there's a lot of those kind of in, uh, times that you're down and you got to figure it out. You got to have figure it out and you got to take be able to take your team and instill that in them. How can we figure it out? Let's not stop. It's not a roadblock. Let's figure it around. If it's too high, how do we go under it? If it's too low, how can we jump over top of it? So it's all the time to and creativity is incredibly important. So what if that MBA has a creativity, it's great. One thing it's really important is being able to understand the financial statements and understand finance because it's not easy. So you either figure it out, you have to hire somebody. What I've done personally is I fired people that have finance backgrounds and walked down through the statements so I could figure it out how to build them. So one of the things is can you can you pick up that skill set or not and especially and again through different stages of the company different skills are required i would say the longer the person's in the company so let's say through a series b you're probably going to want somebody more operational i always say when you start having meetings about meetings it's time to go right got it <laughs> thank you gary thank you for sharing your views about that person as well perfect i'm done with my first round of question about this person like the ceo of the startup um uh, maxim any yep. from you 
Over to you. Yeah, here is a question from my side. Thank you, Sonia. So, first question uh, to Gary. So, uh, if you say about the CEO, no secret that uh, it's a core function. It's like a team player, K team player inside the team, and um, it's like a one man band and should uh, align all uh, functions like a corporate uh, strategy, like a team uh, building, like um, the, uh, communication with external stakeholders. So, and um, in your view, how we can define um, successful mindset of the CEO? What is it? Successful mindset of the CEO, like I said, I mean, creativity is really important. Resilience is important. To be able to understand, to get through, you know, it's and to not give up. You know, these are kind of the soft side of it, but to not give up. It can't be like, oh, I don't know. Yana dayus mojubit, you know, uh, in Russian, uh, uh, I don't know. I hope. It's just you can't have those kind of things. You either believe in your dream or not. And if you can't convey that message, you know, to the audience, to your team and to the world, it's not going to succeed. Do you believe in your dream? And it's not like maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Can you convey that? So those are the kind of things that are really important. And to be able to, to present, to get in front of an audience and practice. Steve Jobs would take six weeks before he would go on stage at the Moscone Center in San Francisco to practice. People said, oh, he's such a great speaker. He was not a good speaker. You got to practice. So get out and practice because what is it about? Think about it. We're here on Zoom today. Yeah. You know, we're in this digitally transformed world. You need to convey that message and make it precise and to the point. So those kind of skills, and it's tweaked a little bit in the last year, but those kind of skills, can they, can they get the message out? Can they get interest from the audience? It's hard to raise money. Right, it's not the same as it was a year ago. I mean, hard in the sense that it's different. So it's not like you can go out to lunch with somebody. Oh, let's go down in El Camino Real in Palo Alto. Let's have breakfast or lunch. Let's talk. I want to get to know you. It's different now, right? So who who can use the mediums wisely? And those are the kind of skill sets that are important. And again, you know, in the in the VCTV in the beginning of the pandemic, things have changed. The way we convey the message on a global basis, the democratization of opportunities change. Now it's a huge opportunity. So can they use it or not? Do they have credibility or not? Do they do what they say they're going to do or not? Those are the kind of things that are important. Do you believe in them? Thank you, Gary, for this comprehensive um, answer. Fully agreed with you. So uh, my next uh, question to Kartik. So uh, let's discuss about uh, leadership styles uh, inside startups. Yep, I uh, want to clarify from my side. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what type of leadership are more successful? It's like hands-on when uh, CEO providing the deep diving inside all process, or it's more like uh, uh, hands-off when uh, CEO like a boss uh, just providing high level, just helicopter view. So please, could you share your uh, view? Yeah, so I think it's never going to be a hands-off leadership. Uh, more often than not in startups, you'd find a CEO being a thinker and a doer in, and then wearing both hats simultaneously and not sequentially. You would need somebody who sets the ground rules, who sets the goals, who sets the vision, who manages the board, who manages the investors, and then more often than not goes out to do and lead and show and show, lead from the front necessarily executing, necessarily implementing the strategies and making sure that the fail-safe limits are never breached, which is where he brings in a very strong sense of accountability, his ability to manage, his ability to tolerate mistakes. More often than not, I've seen startup CEOs are so wary and I'd rather say scared of the investors that they don't allow an organization to make mistakes and they build in those very strong fail-safe levels, which curbs the growth of an organization. So you would rather want somebody who's ambitious, who is a very strong entrepreneurial leader who brings in a very strong sense of cohesive learning. You would have people with different experiences, different pedigrees working in an ambiguous environment. So you don't need a boss. You need a leader who can comfort and bring the best out of every employee in a manner that you get the exponential growth in the first few quarters or first few weeks of, of the business. So that's that's the kind of leader I would look at. Yep. Thank you, Kartik, for this um... So my uh, next question to Hash. Uh, so if you will discuss uh, 
about uh, long-term valuation. Um, there is no secret that uh, it's one of the key functions of the CEO inside each organization. So, but uh, if you say about the like exponential growth cases here inside companies, so uh, by what factors is defined? Is defined by uh, implementation, clear implementation of uh, CEO vision. It's uh, defined by ambitious employees. It's defined by uh, maybe some health factors. Uh, could you share your experience on this? I'm sorry, I could not get the question properly. Could you repeat that? Your voice wasn't very clear. Uh, yep, for in a nutshell, I may uh, just repeat the question. Uh, it means that uh, by which factors defining the exponential growth of the companies? It's uh, following the CEO vision, it's uh, clear implementation of the strategy, it's uh, um, ambitious employees or something else. So it's, it's actually a combination of factors, right? One thing which I see is even though we are having this discussion for the CEO, I kind of believe all the great companies are uh, created not by a single founder, but at least two co-founders in the pair, right? As Marin kind of pointed out, you have a CEO and a COO, right? The CEO leads the company with the vision, with the motivation. He's the one who rallies the employees, drives the company towards a bigger vision, achieving the bigger, bigger goals of the organization. He's the guy who's the driver and ensures that everyone is aligned with the company vision. And you have the COO, who's the guy who's down in the trenches, getting shit done on a regular basis, getting the things which are required and you know getting his hands dirty, right? So you need actually a combination of the two. Uh, finding the combination of two skills in a single person has rarely been uh, possible. In most cases, you always require you know, two people working at that uh, you know, together to kind of take it to the next level. And additionally, as far as growth is concerned, so I used to be a growth marketer myself, right? So the most important aspects of as a growth marketer, which we used to stress on is, you need to focus that your company grows on a five to 10% on a weekly basis. And you do that by constantly creating new experiments on a weekly basis. You have a uh, new experiment for your product team where you test out small different elements of your features. You know, you want to add this feature, you want to add that feature. You tweak that on a weekly basis. Likewise, with your growth and marketing strategies, you tweak that on a weekly basis and you know, see whether you're seeing the growth or not. And as soon as you know, uh, you're constantly developing and growing based on the learnings that you've gotten. So that is one of the key elements. And that that fact is applicable not just for your company, but as an individual as well. So there's this book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, right? It's like one of the most phenomenal books out there. The, the basic premise of the book is simple. If you can grow, the most, most, uh, most innovation doesn't happen by doing something landmark on a single day, but it happens by doing small degrees of innovation on a daily basis, on a consistent basis. And when those gains kind of add up, and then you end up with a huge growth, right? So if you grow yourself by 5% every week, by the end of the year, you would have grown 36 times. That is how much growth you can see. Likewise, on an individual level, if you can grow like 1% on a daily basis, by the end of the year, you can easily grow like 70 times. So that is the essential factor that you need to constantly keep growing, constantly try something new, and constantly be you know moving up. And if you go even 1% behind, within a year, you'll be down to zero. So this is one of the crucial mindset which is required that constantly be, you know, constantly push yourself constantly uh, you know uh, expose yourself to your weaknesses uh, push yourself to new challenges and constantly move forward towards new and new innovations thank you Kash, for this uh, insights so uh, sorry um, it's a question from my side okay yeah perfect thank you maxine for asking those questions okay i've got a question very practical um how does the day day in the life of a ceo looks like for example let's talk about uh if Gary hires the CEO of a, one of his startup portfolio, how his day is going to look like. So starting from <laughs> Karthik, <laughs> I love that. I love, <laughs> I love this. This is exactly what I go through. And uh, fortunately <laughs> or unfortunately, I handle four different businesses and my day begins life. I, like I'm getting into a battle zone. And by the time I come out, I come out, I don't know which battle did I fight, which one did I win and how many am I going to lose? But typically it starts and depending on where you are in a business, if you are in a semi set, a semi solid or semi steady state business, you start by typically identifying where your business was yesterday. And if you are into a typical retail business, as I am in a startup or an e-commerce business, you necessarily go into how, how did your market, how did your consumers, how did your business, how did your indices work yesterday, like for like or wherever you are. 
And then you get into identifying your key priorities in terms of what developmental stage, what department, what functional requirements need to do. By the time you've finished all of it, you suddenly get into an understanding that either your bankers have come to you or your finance controllers have let you down on certain issues and money is suddenly out of the bag and you don't know. By the second half of the day, you get into an understanding that now it's the time to get the organizational geared up. You have people who need to be recruited. You have relationships and partners that need to be up updated up. And by the end of the day, you also have your investors waiting for the end of the day call where you need to go and tell them that, yes, boss, this is what happened and this is where we failed and we're going to come back fighting again tomorrow. And then if you have partners or principals or brands in different parts of the world, the day goes on. So the day begins with a structural review of the business and then gets into resource optimization. And by and, and any time you need to be ready to get into a firefighting mode, because more often than not, you'd realize only after things have gone wrong as a startup. You haven't built proactive systems till now so that you 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 understand that things might go wrong. It's only more often you only come to know of, of, of issues after they've happened. So you need to be ready to handle and ward them off. And you do not have that level of bench strength and organizational structures to make sure that things seamlessly move at every point in time. Whenever things go wrong, you need to be ready to jump in, sort it out like a samurai and again, come back for, with a smiling face to keep the show going. So that's that's how a typical CEO's life goes on in a in a semi uh, solid or semi -sta stable business. Okay, what about the early stage? How different that would be? Early stage would be it would be a new challenge every day. It would be like writing a story in a in an early stage business. You're still building. So what you left last night, the business is more or less in the same state this morning, and you you'd be charting, building onto your story. All that you'd be doing is building a continuum. You're not necessarily a CEO in an early state business till the time and 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 I I would I would be very wary of calling somebody a CEO or building a CEO till the time the business goes out on the ground till that time everybody is a team player or a founding member and then you necessarily assign roles so that that is where you build structures and uh, hierarchies in the organization so in early stages everybody is doing developmental work you left certain codes you left certain SOPs you left certain financials you left certain investment pieces or some certain technical parameters previous night that you need to continue. So what, what necessarily drives and, and, and a typical CEO's uh, day or a typical co-founder's day in early stages is primarily about managing time, managing resources and, and living up to the milestones that they've set for themselves and more importantly, the investors have set for themselves. And how so frequently the, should they be catching up with their investors? How frequently? What's the frequency? It also depends on the maturity of the investors it, and, and it also depends on how how vivid or how uh, reliable that relationship and how pedigreed the co-founders and CEOs are. If I'm a large investor who's got multiple business interests and have after multiple rounds of uh, evaluation invested in a startup, I would give them that much more space to perform and wouldn't want to catch up more than once a week or more than even once a fortnight. But if I'm a very nimble footed investor and if I've just said I have $100,000 and I've given 50 out of that to somebody else to invest in his business, then I would be catching up with him every evening on a phone call. Did you do your job? So it depends on who the investor is. But I, as an investor, I do not catch up with uh, businesses more than once a month. And as a CEO of a business, I do not. And I've been fortunate enough not to be caught up with my investors and principals for more than once a quarter. And very important question. How does the weekend looks like? There are no weekends. There are no weekends for CEOs and there are no weekends for startups. Uh, no, that it, it again is a function of how passionate you are, what side of a business are you in, and how disciplined you are. If you're disciplined, if you're structured, you will always find time for your for yourself, irrespective of what business you are in. If you're not able to create time for yourself and your family, you're setting yourself up for a failure, and you you cannot continue running at the same pace forever. And you're setting a wrong example to the organization. You as a leader might want to work seven days a week. But expecting your organization to work seven days a week unstinted is, is not something that is realistic and it's not something that's going to create a workplace of choice. So weekends are difficult. It depends on what interests and what aptitude do you have and where do you see your organization growing. For example, I can work six to seven days a week, but that doesn't mean that I expect my organization to work. With me. So, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik, for sharing those views. Uh, Harsh, uh, over to you. Yeah. So, uh, as Karthik kind of illustrated pretty well, you know, the CEO's life is completely full with, you know, he is co constantly working on a minefield where he has to ensure that, you know, every step he takes doesn't let off a minefield bomb over there. 
and which could lead to a cascading trigger of blasts as well so it's a very complicated state of affairs it's extremely important to meticulously manage your entire day right because the number of tasks which are required the number of you know the number of people you have to answer to you have to answer so see people think ceo is this glamorous position right he has yeah. so much power he has so much people think being in the ceo position it's it's like oh, you know, you're you have so much authority over people you are the boss but that is actually not the case you are answerable to your employees you are answerable to your investors you are answerable to multiple stakeholders you are answerable to your customers the liability is never end so it takes a, a really courageous person to become a ceo it it it, it is filled it, it's just like you know so uh, back uh, back just when the covid started right i got this very interesting graphic of what the ceo's life looks like his back is stabbed with all these knives and yet he's uh, you know interacting with his uh, employees with a smiling face because he always has to ensure that his employees are not are constantly motivated to get their job done right so that is what an employee uh, ceo's life is like he has to very meticulously manage each and every hour of his life and ensure that you know uh, the company is in the right track uh, ensure the vision of the company is in the right track and each and everything is communicated very effectively so it's not an easy job definitely it's, and if you just look at the some of the leading examples which did not work out well in the last uh, couple decades uh, john scully was the legendary pepsico ceo who came to apple and unfortunately you know a couple years down the line the company was in a very bad shape and steve jobs kind of came back to rescue the company you look at marissa mayer with yahoo same thing company was strug- company is struggling to kind of recover back its glory days right so uh, it's very easy to blame on the ceo that you know the ceo didn't do the job well and uh, he kind of screwed the company but if you look at the kind of uh, uh, the the troubles and the difficulties that they face it's like a crown but it's a crown of thorns it's not a it's not a golden crown it's a crown of thorns crown of thorns rightly said actually Ash, thank you. Sorry, do you want to add something before I interrupted you? Were you done? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Sorry, Maren. Maren, okay. would you like to add something? Yes. Uh, yeah. If it's my turn, I'd like to add something. So I don't know what the CEOs of our portfolio companies are doing. Not at all. But I know. they have the telephone number of all investment committee members and i also know that they are going to call us if they are heading towards uh, one of the rails so what about the rails uh, we touched that topic before and i think it's very important that any ceo and so that the supervisory board or investment committee need to do gives direction and set the rails they can be wider they can be a little bit narrower in this way or that way Uh, depending on stage and economic conditions so i'm sure uh, a ceo will call us if they need advice and if they are heading actually to one of the rails not if they are touching the rail even beforehand to see how can we turn around the business development so i think that's very important uh, we also have to take care that we don't run into that trap of micromanagement uh, being involved in everything you know and expecting Uh, immediate replies uh, from uh, from your startups if you shoot out an email also so we have a monthly report that monthly report uh, we are reading it if it's in line of the direction there will be no meeting and there will be no talks if none uh, of the parties requests for it we are meeting four times a year everybody is getting a pre-read and then we have a discussion this doesn't mean that we go under cover or we want CEOs to wonder about but there needs to be a trigger hey let's talk let's talk i need your advice but it's not that controlling controlling stage uh regarding weekends and and employee well being um you know uh regarding expectation management you send an email or you receive an email a couple of minutes later you receive your whatsapp you receive a whatsapp announcing that an email has been sent to you and if you don't respond to the whatsapp hey what happens next your phone is ringing so we try to calm down that expectation management and i don't want to say we want to go slow slow doesn't work in startup it needs to be flexible and super fast speed counts that's the fuel of a startup but we also need to be a little bit structured and expect, uh, and do expectation management 
So how did we do that? We tried out a lot of things. So these days we have an understanding internally in most startups if they decided to do so, but especially uh, in the connection uh, to, to us as an investor, to our investment committee, there are two slots a day and everybody is setting them uh, individually to answer emails. So nobody ex is expecting an immediate answer by default. You will get an answer during the day, but you have to wait. If it's super urgent, we pick up the phone and say, hey, now it's urgent, we need to talk. That's one topic. The other topic is uh, we are motivating everybody actually to block focus time and to block private time in their calendars and then to silence all notifications. It has various reasons for sure. It's for the well-being. Secondly, it's also to safeguard your private life. And thirdly, it's to have time where you really can concentrate and focus on something. Didn't we all kind of experience that? Uh, some time ago, you had one hour or two hours to focus on something. If you need to, to do, especially in studies, a, a little thesis or case study or, so, or whatsoever. And now it's all cut in little bits and pieces. We are easily distracted. So that's the third topic. So what stage are these startups uh, in? Uh, C, Series A, Series B, Series C. And we do also hold stakes in very major companies. So it's a little bit of everything. So so across all the seats, you're gonna have catch up like four times a year. It's, it's the same, okay. Yeah, it's the same. it's the same for everybody and for any stage. That's by default. These are the meetings. Uh, we have set agendas. We have extraordinary items. We always have pre-reads and then everybody is present. It's a, it's a discussion on interaction really and on advice. Then we have the monthly reports, which are sent over into a tool. We have a look at it. And if somebody wants to discuss a topic, we discuss it. If something goes red, well, then there needs to be a discussion for sure, uh, internally or, or with our investment committee. That's how we run the show. And there's no difference on seat uh, to, to, uh, to corporates. OK, great. Thank you, Marin. Thank you for sharing your views. Gary, over to you. Four times in a year? Or Kartik says seven days in a week. <laughs> <laughs> I think for Gary, it's day and night. <laughs> uh, you know, so the situation is you need to have, so on, on one side, you need to have some private time. You need to decompress. So whenever that is, I particularly like to work a lot. So I work from 5 to 11 o'clock at night. I personally like it. I enjoy it. Uh, I do carve out time during the day personally to, to go bike riding or whatever, an hour or two hours or whatever. I carve some time out to be able to decompress. In terms of, you know, being able to address, uh, depending on the stage of the company, many times we'll do monthly uh, meetings with the investors. So we'll have board meetings every month. And the reason is to be able to, you know, when you're doing a startup, it's about having a pulse check every single day to understand where that company is. And I look at the board members from my standpoint as really partners. And I want their input as part of the team because they got valuable experience. I mean, think about all the knowledge that's here just on the panel today. So everybody has a different way of looking at things. And one thing you, happens when you're the CEO of a company is you get really tunnel vision. You're so focused on getting something done. You, for, you may forget us about something that's on either, either side and have it a really good board to be able to give you that information is important. In terms of monthly reports, every month we do a report and uh, that's part of the board meeting, right? So you present it to the board, you review it, where are we? And especially in early stage startup because things change so quickly, yep. right? You're, you're changing all the time. You're pivoting, you're changing. And the main you know, characteristic is customer development. Do you have something that people really want to buy in an early, early stage company? Many times what will happen is there'll be technology founders that believe that people are going to buy this no matter what. And so we don't care what the opinion is, they're going to buy it. In reality, you've got to go out and continually test and validate your hypothesis to make sure that people really want to buy it. And as uh, Bob Dorsch says, grab it out of your hand. So from my standpoint, it's no matter what stage of the company, we do monthly meetings and we have... Uh, 
board meetings to get input from members, different ideas. And we like to have, you know, we don't want to have dumb money. We want smart money, smart money to give insight because dumb money you can get, but smart money where you have great team members that can give you insights. And by the way, your idea is when I look at it, every one of the board members is somebody that's going to invest in my next company, right? They're going to be interested. So you're doing a great job and they want to be on board because everybody reaps in the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for sharing your views as well. So it's a monthly board meeting for Gary. Thank you. Uh, Vandana, over to you. So, um, you know, uh, Sunny, this is a very, uh, uh, you know, I can just go on and on for this question. See, everybody is hustling in their own way. Um, so um, I think uh, each and everybody is uh, trying to deal with uh, uh, so many things which sometimes they speak about, sometimes they don't. So typically for me, uh, on weekdays, the day begins at 5 o'clock. I do my exercises, uh, my walks, come back, uh, you know, come back home and I start my day at 10. Then I'm on and on the entire day till sometimes at uh, 12 midnight. And after 12 midnight, my bandwidth goes away. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, on weekends, uh, on Sundays, I totally detox myself from gadgets, from clients, from everybody. And I take enough rest uh, uh, so that, you know, I can uh, charge myself up and get back to the hustle again. So for working women, it's uh, something different. We have to hustle more than just being a CEO. Uh, you know, I have to manage my kids also. Sometimes I'm getting calls from school. Sometimes something else is happening. So it's a lot more thing, uh, you know, which we go to from uh, day to day in our day to day life. So I guess we are all firefighting. I'm sure you are also. And like Gary mentioned and the others that we are all uh, firefighting in our own way. But the main uh, uh, the thing is we need to be calm, composed. Uh, have fun with whatever we are doing, even if it's dealing with the worst situation. Uh, you know, just enjoy, have fun, and just be calm at everything that you're doing and just do it with a smiling face. I think you get, uh, everything gets sorted very easily. So I really enjoy my work uh, and uh, I love doing what I'm doing. So I, uh, you know, uh, I really don't have those days of, uh, you know, I do have a lot of days of commotion, but I just take it uh, uh, as a fun thing and uh, deal with it uh, every day. So, right. That's so I think this is another topic for another day. Women CEOs versus male CEOs. You're okay. For this one. You're going to invite me for this one. Please make sure that I'm invited. And make sure Vandana is invited on this one as well. Vandana, the party is still not over. I'm <laughs> <laughs> the same episode every day and I keep thinking, when am I going to get one more go at this one? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Vandana, for sharing your day. Uh, you know, yeah. your schedules in a day and everything else. Um, we understand, obviously, as for families as well. And thank you so much for making this very enriching for me. Um, uh, Gary, Harsh, Kartik, Moraine, Vandana, all of you have different viewpoints about this person, which is fair enough, which is good, which is, you know, should be like that. Thank you very much. We probably have another session. I'll talk to the team and have another session uh, to digress even further more into this person. <laughs> it's interesting. I hope everybody liked this uh, uh, show today, the speakers. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. This is This brings us to the end of the show. Quickly closing remarks, just one more minute before we hit 8, uh, 8 p.m. Sorry, 7.30 p.m. So quickly closing remarks for the week end. Let's start with Vandera. Yeah, uh, so uh, like I always say, thank you, Sunny, for having me on this show again and again. Uh, this show is for like-minded people. We connect from people all over the world. Uh, we impart our knowledge and give insights. Uh, so I would recommend uh, many people to come on this platform and speak out uh, their mind like how we do. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me on this show. Uh, just one more thing which I wanted to add is uh, one very important characteristic uh, of being a CEO is being fearless. You know, you have to take out the fear from your mind 
and just be uh, you know courageous if you fear you are going to just limit yourself from achieving the goals so i think uh, you know be fearless uh, you know do things from your conscious uh, conscious level read the book power of the subconscious mind and be positive always thank you thank you vandana we have a lot of lot of viewers and a lot of comments coming from people watching this show today and they are really loving your insights thank you and some of them said that they can relate <laughs> thank you vandana okay. over to you with your closing remarks uh yeah beside uh, regular uh meetings uh between larger groups so the leadership team and your your investors uh my advice is keep checking in on one to ones with all of your team members and with all of your portfolio companies and vice versa uh this is even more important these days as uh, we do a lot of remote work and you need to feel the temperature and uh, get in touch on one to one discussions uh, with everybody and sometimes one to one discussions is just easier for more introvert people to speak out about their feelings uh, about their worries or about their ideas so that would be my advice uh, for today thanks for having me thank you marian thank you so much for sharing your views and insights and lovely having you back uh kartik your closing remarks for the weekend so the ceo in a in a in a startup is typically like a boxer in a ring it's not about how hard he can hit or how hard he can get hit it's about how many times he falls and he comes back to fight and then ultimately how does he win and that's how startups win and that's how they succeed so i would always bet on a person who brings in resilience ambiguity management and more importantly ability to take risk and thank you for hosting me once again it was a pleasure meeting all of you and now let me go out for a beer this evening thank you how fun kartik yes <laughs> thank you for joining us all the time on CCTV and great insights from you as always. Thank you, Harsh. Your closing yeah. remarks. Sure. So Karthik kind of took the words out of my mouth itself. You know the kind of point which he mentioned. Uh, if anyone has seen the movie Rocky Balboa, that's kind of the dialogue which he says to his son. And I, it's one of the most inspirational, motivational quotes I've ever read. So uh, you know the life is going to keep hitting you harder. All you have to do is take the hits and keep moving forward. you have to be doing that that is the only way you're going to succeed because the life of the ceo is very tough so at the same time i suggest as a ceo it is it is very uh, easy for a person to get truly engaged in kind of you know uh, not being able to trust anyone and try to micromanage everything so you need to be ensure you need to have to have the trust in your employees to delegate the work to them and you know uh, try and delegate as much as you can so that you don't have to end up you know doing your time doing operational stuff that is one of the important lessons i would like to give and as always glad to be here glad to be with you sony and gary karthik vandana and marin amazing session as always and uh, looking forward for more such uh, family reunions <laughs> oh yes there you go <laughs> family reunion like that <laughs> thank you thank you uh gary the next family member <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I was going to use the uh, Rocky Balboa and not get back up, and it's not the person gets down, it's the person gets up. But also, it's kind of like Forrest Gump. You know, life is like a box of chocolates. You just never know what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> so, being a CEO is like that. You never know. But it's a person that can deal with it, get the job done. So you got to stay positive. You got to stay happy. You got to be optimistic. You got to believe in your dreams. You got to visualize where you want the company to go, and have that really cemented in your mind and paint those pictures. Because if you do that, you know things start to line up to move the company in that direction. Happiness, joy, optimism brings people around. It brings it builds a group because people want to be around people that are are happy and optimistic. They don't want to be around uh, folks that are negative. It doesn't work. So that's how you build a group. And listen, it's never easy, but guess what? It's a lot of fun. So, you know, people can reach me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, Gary Fowler, um, great to hear from him, and looking for those incredible AI and quantum companies. So, great to be here. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Thank you so much for all the viewers to be part of this BCTV family and coming back. 
uh, <laughs> of his family reunion, like you know, to get that like harsh judgment <laughs> like that. Or familiar faces, and yeah, thank you so much for being a part of this movie. And I, I always thoroughly look forward to this time uh, every day to come back and talk to you all. I mean, this is this, this is this keeps me going for the rest of my day. <laughs> so I think I'm very excited to um, post this oh. show as well as always. So yeah, it's a Friday, and Kathik is going to have his beer, and for me as well, it's a weekend. And of of course, for Gary, it's coming to the end of the day, and all of us. Um, just you know, unwind over the week. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll be back on Monday with another set of topics for the week, another set of speakers. Till then, keep watching BCTV. You can do the playbacks as much as you can and learn from the from whatever the, the speakers have shared today. So yeah, that's it. That's all for me. And have a great weekend, all of you. See you again on Monday. Bye bye. Bye bye.